Do we have that clicker there? Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for having us. My name's Brad Robertson. This is my colleague and friend, Toby Fitch. Uh, now for something completely different. We're here to share with you our point of view that clients don't really care about improv. And we actually think this is a point that's been made at multiple times throughout the conference. Uh, yesterday, Rich had that beautiful technological presentation about clients and what they really do care about. It's not that clients don't care about improv necessarily. Some of them actually like it. But they have needs and issues of their own that are deeply important to them. And we think it's our job first to understand those better. Because if you understand the needs of your audience, in this case your client, you'll be better served to meet those needs. Toby, maybe a few words about yourself. My colleague Gary was up here on your feet. We've been doing this for about 16 years. And Toby has been a great inspiration and help to us as we have, I think, up, upped our skill around this, around this topic. So I've asked Toby Thank to you. join us. Brad is most comfortable on stage with other stocky, bald men. And <laughs> I am here to represent that and manifest it for you in this living, breathing space. Yes. Thank you, Gary. Breathe in stocky baldness and exhale something different. So, uh, two things. As, as we've talked to a number of you and thinking about what nuances to get at in this topic in 15 minutes with you, a couple of things. Uh, one, there's been, as Brad said, lots of great talk about how to engage with clients. Many of you are figuring out, how do I take what I'm crafting as a practice and go whatever the next step deeper with clients looks like, yes? Whatever that is. And we want to help you with that, both how to frame it and then to think about some tools we use to actually further that conversation. So that's what we're thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Yesterday, uh, my co other colleague, Amy, came up and shared a story uh, with us. And I thought uh, we'd take this moment to reincorporate something that she shared with her story of riding Expedition Everest. And uh, here it is. There she is. You'll notice uh, we have our, our Disney friend up here. Those of you who remember, Amy was, was frightened to ride this roller coaster. Our friend from Disney is just ecstatic. I feel very happy to be here. Amy, on the other hand, if you can see that, is absolutely horrified. <laughs> and, you know, we were inspired, and Amy said, sure, I'll send you that picture. You can put it in there. We were inspired <laughs> to just uh, kind of bring that back from yesterday. But as we started thinking about this a little bit, we think this is, um, is kind of what sometimes can happen with your clients. You know, oftentimes we get called in. You have somebody who is a client of yours who took an improv class or saw you at a conference, they're really excited about it. And they are like this woman on the top, your top right there. Some people may be kind of agnostic about improv, but when they really get into it and you ask them to play Bunny Bunny, you might see a little bit of this. And again, we think if you can do a bit more work on the front end in terms of really understanding what your clients care about, you can avoid uh, this example of Amy. So Amy, thank you for being a sport and letting us use this photograph. Because this is not what you want to see happen in a workshop. I, I've come to call this the mask of the Red Death. <laughs> Amy Veltman, that version. So here then, one way to think about this, the client on the left loves improv. How many of you have clients who actually love improv and ask for it by name? Awesome. You could leave now if you wanted. Um, the room. I mean, there's great conversations to be had outside. You could go do that. Because for those of us who have clients who ask for improv by name, it's wonderful and lovely. And we get to bring that art form to them. And they take it in and wonderful. I'll ask you this question, though. How many of you have those same clients where other people in their organizations might not feel the same way or harbor the same verve and enthusiasm that they do? So stay in the room. Uh, Part of our job, we think, when we're talking to clients, is not just the person in front of us, yeah. but really figuring out how to help these clients, because many of them don't know how to be good clients, right? Help them be better clients. Building better clients could be the subtitle of the next 12 minutes. We want to help these clients be better with the people that aren't in the room. And if we don't talk about their organizational and business issues and help them think about how to frame improv, 
they're not effectively positioning it back at home. We were with a big tech company a few years ago, and this woman had seen us in action, and she was really pumped about story. And I was on a conference call with her and her boss, and she was saying, you got this story thing is amazing, you're not going to believe it. And the boss said, you know, I know you like story, but we've got real challenges, so let's focus on those. And we think you can do both. You can use story to focus on challenges if you're clear about what you're solving for. Good. We asked some of you what you hear when you first get involved in a client engagement. Mm. You know, what you sometimes say or what they come and say to you. And here are a few things you said. You know, some of you say, I know I've got this great improv and, and it's going to really help them. That's something you might say internally. Or you might actually say that to them. We've got some improv and I know it's going to help. Uh, we've already talked about the idea that one client might come and others might be skeptical. Let me just quickly poll the audience, Brad. I'm just curious about this. Uh, how many of you would say, yeah, I've heard people say the first one? Got those clients? Great. Uh, like number two, that scenario, you've been in that dilemma or are now? Three? Like, yeah, they say X, but the truth of the matter is, as far as I can tell, they kind of suck as a person, perhaps. I don't know. Um, more interactivity in our meetings? Mm, you guys have some things you do that are kind of interesting. Could you come do them for us? Great. So that kind of formed some of the context for what we wanted to share with you in this brief session. Here's our goal. We want to give you three brief tools to help you think about being more successful in transformation. Because the more you know about your clients and the clearer you can be about that, the more you're going to be set up for success. Here are the three tools. Find out what they really need. Oftentimes, people will come and say, we just need more morale. Now, you, might, there, you don't want to stop there. You don't want to say, OK, great, let me go work on that. You want to find out what they really need. You want to, and Toby will talk more about this, you want to name and frame the issues. And then lastly, you want to what we call see them first. And we think this is an idea. It's both a tactic and a philosophy. Yeah. It's about your audience, not about you in our, from our point of view. So this first concept, find out what they really need. Here's what we'll invite you to do. Go ahead, Toby. Yeah, so if each of you right now, you've got the general ballpark we're operating in, correct? Which is, how do we think about framing things with clients and setting expectations and positioning the work we do? So our invitation to you right now, please take us up on it, is picture a real client you either have right now where you're kind of trying to get stuff positioned or someone you want to get in with further. Got it? Take an actual moment of real time right now and write down the name of the client on a page or device in front of you. And by moment, we mean 30 seconds. That's nice. The paper is very good. The paper works. It's fine. So here is our point of view on some, some questions, as Karen Dawson says, some kick-ass questions that you might use when you want to find out more about what your client really cares about and what they really need. These are pretty simple, and some of you probably use them. But here's the first one. It's simply this. Tell me more about your needs and issues around X. Sometimes it's tempting just to say, just tell me what's going on. We think it's really helpful to narrow that down and frame the issue. So tell me more about your needs and issues around audience engagement and presentations. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about your needs and issues around running more effective meetings. Tell me more about your needs and issues around communicating between WHQ and your off-site production plants. Yeah. And one comment about just our mindset as we show up to ask the questions, there's the tactics of the questions and there's how we show up, right? Uh, Looking at just the questions right now, how many of you see one question here that you might benefit from asking or asking again with one of those clients you just wrote down? Yes? A couple of examples. What are one of the questions that stand out you could benefit from using right now? How does the initiative link to the larger strategic goals? Okay. Tie it for me to the larger strategic goals of the initiative. What else? What's another question? What's that? The example of the story of what gets in the way. 
Great, so those are some of the tactics. I just want to take one sidebar to say, what can get in the way for me? I know these questions often, and I put a self-limiting lens on, which is, um, I have never written software at Google. So when I'm asking them these questions, part of me feels like I'm showing up as a fake, and if we could just get the frick through to, could you agree to a contract and some dates, victory, problem solved, right? What I need to remind myself to do, and yes and in the moment is, if I get enough of the story, I might be able to imagine what they're talking about. And I want to hold as my own mantra, what's a day in the life like for these guys? Because the challenges they're facing have probably freaking very little to do with the code they write. But I also want to ask about that, meeting the monster, as Gary might say. I want to lean into the stuff I don't know about to figure out what else is going on. Because we're all going to figure, every time we ask these questions, every one of the problems we get invited to play with is a multi-source problem, yes? Multi-contributing factors. And part of my job before I do any improv or anything is to help them see that. And that's the next thing we're going to. Yeah. Uh, one phrase that I learned from my old boss at Portland State is just this simple phrase of say more about that. That seems to really resonate and seems to be a really nice invitation for people to talk further. Simply say more about that. I do think, as we think about these questions, the more that you can tie your particular event or training program to the initiatives that are larger within the organization, yeah. the more successful you'll be in that, in that arena. And I think also the more value you will be to the organization and the more money you can charge. So being cognizant of the bigger picture is really an advantage. Yeah, one, so one last thing. So we're listening for the problem. We're listening for multiple contributing factors. We're asking things like, what else might be happening, right? And as Brad said, I am, honest to God, listening for a way to structure my connection to the money. Just because I'm a pragmatist and I want to make him a better client, and most internal managers and directors and even VPs don't even know how to access their own budgets. And if I can say, what are the big initiatives in HR right now? And they say, oh, there's this whole thing around employee engagement. Oh, well, let's partly frame what we're doing around employee engagement. Is that part of the issue? Yes. Oh, OK. Right? So listen for the themes and the framing and the positioning. It is authentic, and it's about using their language and their frame to tie it to bigger initiatives, not just for the money, but so it gets the kind of leadership attention it's going to need to do something besides a one-day workshop or a series of things. So that's part of getting a better picture, asking more, and getting more clarity. Name and frame. Toby, we'll take a couple minutes with this, yeah. and then we're going to move right yeah. into it. Well, some of it we just said. I mean, yeah. some of that framing is how do we tie it back to bigger initiatives? But I would say three things. We often get stuck on only wanting to go with what we heard. And if you've been in some of the breakouts about listening to your own gut, right, I like to be able to say to people, Here's some stuff I've heard. Here's some things I've seen. And you know, if I compare this to what we've seen elsewhere, here's what we hear, right? If there's one of those three things you could be bringing more to the party, which one is it for yourself? Telling them more what you heard, letting them know what you also notice, because you are an instrument of change, or bringing to the party what you know from elsewhere. Just make a note for yourself. I could do more of one of these three things. So lastly is this notion of see them first. And, and we wanted to share briefly some examples of how we execute this. Here are, here's one example from a recent engagement with a technology firm in a room very similar to this. We will say, we had a chance to speak with many of you before we came here. And in the design process, here's what you told us around your needs and issues around influencing. And then they shared some of these acronyms, which we understood about 90% of. And we read this to them. Now, in a large session or in a session where we've got some time, we'll often ask the audience, what did we miss? What else? Another example from Toby. Yeah, just the same thing. Be asked for training and asked for training and asked for training and saying, that's great. Training will never be the whole solution. What do the managers need to do differently? What piece could training do? And even though you're not asking me to help it, I want to advise you to look at your hiring process, your promotion process, and how you review people. Now, could we do some fun exercises and use something people call improvisation? Sure. 
let's do those exercises focused on those behaviors and those skills. And oh yeah, we might bring something that we'll call a pride improv, but we'll never lead with that. It's what we happen to be using as a means to an end. We'll also use this in proposals. What we heard from you is, and list that. It's, it's a mantra for us, the audience before us. Here's what you told us. Here's what you told us. What else, what did we miss? Okay, now that we understand the problem, here's how we think we might be able to help. And improv is one of those tools. We hope this has been helpful for you. We hope you got something out of it. Feel free to ask questions afterwards. And I think we are out of time. We'll turn it back over to Rebecca. So thanks Thank very much. Thank you very much. much. There she is, ladies and gentlemen.